Okay, in this online lecture we're going to be talking about um, engines and refrigerators and the efficiency uh, or the, uh, the performance of these types of systems, engines and refrigerators. Um, and in a previous online lecture we talked about a fairly complicated refrigerator called the adiabatic demagnetization refrigerator. But today we're going to work with a simpler system. Uh, it's still more well, it's still quite a bit simpler than a real engine or a refrigerator that you might have in your home or in your car or something like that. Um, but it works using ideal gas and compression and expansion and that sort of thing. So it uses the, the tools that we've developed and we can understand easily in this course. Okay, so um, that's the topic for today. So we're going to be talking about engines. refrigerators and specifically we'll figure out how to calculate um, the efficiency of how they're working. So the efficiency of an engine efficiency. and for refrigerators it's the, the technical term that we use is not efficiency but it's the, the coefficient of performance. COP it's coefficient of performance. Okay so um, to get started, so the simple system that we're going to work with, sometimes I refer to it as, as the bike pump refrigerator. So this is the example system that we're going to work with. Um, and the reason I call it a bike pump system is because um, and you may have noticed this as well, is that if you have a bike pump and you suddenly compress the, the air as you're pumping it into the tire of the bike, you may have noticed that the, the metal canister that the pump is made of, sometimes, uh, well, when you compress it, it gets warm, right? So that tendency to warm up um, and change temperature uh, can be used in, in a way to, to do useful work in terms of an engine or in a reverse situation to extract heat from um, the environment or from a, from a box, say, that's your, your cold refrigerator. Okay, so, but I'm, I'm not really going to uh, consider a bike pump. We're going to make a sort of idealized system here, so let me make a sketch here first of what we're talking about um, to get started. All right, so let's make a somewhat complicated drawing to start with here. So we're going to make a, so just bear with me for a second here. So in this system, there will be this central chamber that has ideal gas in it. And um, on either side of that central chamber there will be two um, sort of side chambers here so um, let's see here so this part is sort of wall some sort of wall material and now I'm going to make a somewhat complicated picture here so to um, you'll see in a moment why it's going to be this complicated, but for the moment, draw it such that you've got these thick walls everywhere except for at these two spots. So let's call this chamber over here the room, and this chamber over here we'll call the refrigerator or the fridge. Okay, so in the end, we're going to be manipulating or causing expansion and compression of the gas in this chamber in order to move heat either this way or that way from the room to the refrigerator or from the refrigerator to the room. And the way we're going to do that is by um, compressing or expanding this gas. So you could draw this additional part to the system, which is a sort of, um, is a sort of cylinder here. Uh, I'm sorry, a, a compression piston here that you can move up and down. So this thing up here is supposed to be a handle. If you press it up and down, then you're compressing 
or expanding the gas in this chamber. Okay, so one more detail that we need is that these, these two spots in the wall, um, I'm going to draw a sort of a door on them. So this one has a door that can be open, as I've drawn it here, or it can be closed um, if we don't want to allow heat exchange between the gas and the room. Likewise, on this side, we'll have another door that can be opened or closed. Opened if we want to allow heat exchange between the gas and the fridge. Closed if we want to prevent heat exchange between the gas and the fridge. Okay, so there's our complicated drawing. Let's now think about how we could use this um, to do something useful. So for instance, let's, let's work on the refrigerator example first. Let's think about how we can extract heat from, the, from this chamber and dump it in the room. That's what a refrigerator does, right? So by, by a system of steps where we compress and expand the gas and open and close these doors, we can extract heat from this side and dump it on this side. So how do we do that? All right, so um, for such a refrigeration system, so let's maybe put um, refrigerator There's going to be several steps. Okay, so the first step is that we will um, compress, and I'm going to say isothermally compress. It doesn't have to be isothermal compression, but for the example that we're going to work with, we're going to consider that the compression step is done isothermally. So isothermally compress. Um, the gas here um, with okay. Let's put a label on each of these doors here. So let's let's call this one uh, door one, and this one door two. Okay. So during this compression step, um, door two will be open. So this is with door two open. So when I say isothermally, that means the compression is done keeping the gas at the same temperature as the room. So what does that mean? As, as you're compressing the gas, normally it would heat up if it wasn't um, allowed to exchange energy with the room. Right? If, this door, if, door, if all the doors were closed and you compress the gas, the gas would go to a higher temperature. We know that from ideal gas law. But if this door two is open, and the gas is allowed to exchange heat with the room, then as you're compressing it, heat will get dumped to the room. Okay, and while we're doing this, we'll say that the door one is closed so that we don't dump heat to the refrigerator side. Again, we're trying to cool this side, so we don't want to dump heat in that side. We want to dump heat in this side. Okay, so that's step one, isothermal compression. Step two is going to be adiabatic uh, expansion. And in this case, uh, during the expansion, just again, we know from ideal gas law, if the gas expands, it gets cooler. Um, and if, okay, so, during this cooling step, um, we're going to close both doors. So let's just say door one and door two closed. So we're going to close the doors, pull the piston out fast. Well, it doesn't matter how fast. If the doors are closed, there's no energy exchange. So we expand the gas, uh, and it's adiabatic because there's no energy loss or gain in the gas. So that adiabatic expansion cools the gas. All right. So this cools the gas. And then in step three, what we'll do next is extract heat from the from the refrigerator side. So we'll extract heat from this side and dump it into the gas. That is going to be um, okay. So we'll call that extract. 
heat from the fridge. Okay, and that will be with door one open and door two closed. So one open, two closed. Okay, and then finally, next, well, almost the last step, and then we'll repeat this in a cycle. So the last step in the cyclic process is to extract heat uh, from the room. So this part may sound weird, but y you'll see in a moment how this works. Okay, so heat from room. This is with door one closed and door two open. Visible on my screen? Not really. Okay, one second here. So this step is with one closed and two open. Exactly. Yeah, okay, it's visible. Okay, so those are the four steps. Um, so what I'm going to do next is uh, draw this on a PV diagram. Okay, so um, let's see, let's draw a PV diagram here, pressure versus volume. Okay, so I want to draw this process um, that the, so that what we're going to draw here is a trajectory on this pressure versus volume diagram for what's happening in the gas. Okay, so um, step one, like we said, is to compress the gas. So that is, we're going to go from some um, some some initial vo volume to some final volume. And let's say we start here at this pressure and this this volume. Then step one is isothermal compression. So that's going to be um, something like this. So that's step one. This is compression along an isotherm. So then step two is adiabatic expansion. Um, so adiabatic expansion, again, it involves a temperature drop. So it's going to go below this isotherm. This isotherm is all at one temperature. So adiabatic expansion is cooling the gas, so it's going to drop. We're going to expand back to the same initial volume. So something like this the same and back to the same initial volume but to a lower temperature so that's step two and then step three is to extract heat from the fridge so the, that means heat is coming from here to there so the gas temperature is rising at fixed volume so maybe it goes to here that is step three and then the final step is to, to close this cyclic process and come back to room temperature. So at, um, let's maybe draw in a different color here, at this point T is, is room temperature, at this point here um, it's, the, uh, it's some lowest temperature, so let's call this T low and at this midpoint here, the temperature is the, the temperature of the fridge. Okay. All right. So that, that's a description of the process. That is, this is a description of how we could use this system as a refrigeration mechanism to, to cool this refrigerator side um, and dump heat to the, the room side. If you repeat this 
cyclic process over and over and over again. Um, eventually what will happen is that uh, eventually that this T refrigerator can, can reach this T low. That's as cold as it can get using this particular process. But eventually this midpoint temperature here will be as low as T low and then it won't get any colder. That's sort of the limit of the, what I've described here. Okay. So, um, let's next write down uh, a way to use the same system as an engine. Okay, so the idea is that uh, instead of, of using this system to extract heat from this refrigerator side, we're going to use this system to uh, do useful work. That is, uh, we'll use the changes in the gas to push this piston around so that it does useful work. Um, that's, for instance, a car engine or a steam engine has a piston that gets pushed around and the piston then moves the car wheels or the train wheels or something like that, right? So how could we conceive of this system with a different set of steps to do useful work, that is to work as an engine? Okay, so that's what I'm going to describe next. Okay, so as an engine. Now we can keep the pic this picture will keep the same. What we'll do is consider a different cyclic process. So this one, this drawing here is for the refrigerator process. Um, what we're going to do now is consider a second different process that will act as an engine. Okay, so. And it turns out that uh, all we have to do is run this loop in reverse, and then it will be doing useful work for us. Okay, so um, let's maybe start with a drawing of a P, uh, we'll start with a PV drawing. Um, for an engine now. Turns out this is a general phenomenon. That is, anytime you have a cyclic process that goes in a counterclockwise loop, so you see the, the arrows are going around the loop counterclockwise, then it can be used as a useful uh, process for removing heat as operating as a refrigerator. And if you run the same loop in reverse, that is in a clockwise direction, then it can be used as an engine to do useful work. So that's a sort of general feature, and you'll see why in a moment when we um, talk about efficiency. Okay, so the engine picture should have the same shape on the PV diagram, but now it's going to be operating in a different direction, um, and we're going to, okay, so that's what it's going to look like ultimately. Let's think about the different steps and what happens during the different steps. Okay, so let, let's call this step one just for now. So step one for the engine is going to be to dump heat to the, we'll keep calling this thing a fridge side just because that's how my drawing is labeled. So we'll call this first step dumping heat to the fridge side. Um, so that is, this is going to cool the gas. Okay, so we're going to assume this side is cool compared to the gas, and we'll just basically open this door one and close door two and let the gas cool down. So this is, um, say that door one is open. And door two is closed. And, we'll, and also the piston is not moving, so piston fixed. Okay. So that, that is what piston fixed means, volume's not changing. This is a vertical step here. 
fixed volume. Okay, so in step two, then, that will be this step, when we do this adiabatic compression. Okay, and as, as usual, during compression of an ideal gas, the gas will heat up, and if we're doing this adiabatically, that means both are closed, one and two are closed. So there's no energy exchange with the gas. We're just compressing it and it heats up. So all right, and then in the final step, step three here, um, we allow the gas, so you can imagine during the step two, you're squishing the gas by, by uh, pushing the piston down. And then imagine you, uh, you sort of let the push, if you let the piston go now, it's going to want to go back up uh, to expand, to allow the system to expand. But we're, what we're going to do is allow that expansion to happen at, um, because this is an isotherm, we're just running this process in reverse. This is going to be isothermal expansion. So that is going to be somewhat slow expansion. Um, again, with door two, or with door one closed, and door two open. So that's it's expanding while maintaining temperature uh, with the room at room temperature. So um, during this step. As the piston is rising, the gas is doing work on the outside world, right? This thing is pushing up. Uh, it's doing work. The gas is doing work on its own environment. Or you could put it differently and say the work done on the gas is negative. Okay, so that step, this isothermal expansion step, is the step where useful work can be done by the gas. That's why we could call it an engine. Um, uh, or you could try using it as an engine. So during this step, work done by the gas on the environment. Okay. All right. So that, that's just basic, again, these are so far just basic qualitative descriptions of um, how you can use a cyclic process to either do work or to move heat. So um, in this fridge scenario, we're moving heat from this side to that side. In the engine scenario, we're going to use the step during expansion to do some useful work. Now, the question is, uh, or one question is, how useful is this? Like, if this step where the engine is, is expanding and doing work is, uh, is doing, uh, well, you want to ask the question, is this an efficient engine? So what does that mean? So let's, I'm going to erase this part and define some quantities that allow us to talk about, is this a good engine or a good refrigerator? Or how good is it? Okay, so we're going to define uh, engine efficiency. So the efficiency of an engine is defined, um, it's usually given this little E symbol, it's defined as the net work done during the cyclic process. Uh, divided by the heat, um, so this is the heat that's added to the system in order to uh, do the useful work. Okay, so let's let's think about let's break this apart a bit here. So first, let's think about the numerator. What do I mean by the net work uh, done here? So the, in this case, um, for an engine, we're talking about 
the work done by the gas on its environment because that's what makes an engine useful. Okay, so W net here refers to the total work done by the gas uh, on its environment. So if that number is bigger, the efficiency of the engine goes up, but it's relative to how much heat you have to put in to get it to, to do that useful work. Okay, so um, let's be more specific in this particular case. What is the net work? Well, if you remember work, just recall that in general the work is my, this is the work done on the gas is going to be obtained by this general integral, right? We need to integrate how pressure changes with volume as you change volumes. It's, or you can think of it as this is the area under the curve of any, any one of these steps. You could calculate the work done based on the area under the curve during that step. So the area under the curve for step two is, say, I'll use a different color here. Is this green area? And the area under the curve for step three. So, so the work done during step two is that area. The er the work done during step three is this larger area. So the net work, and they have opposite sign too, right? So the the magnitude of the work is always just the area under the curve, but the sign of the work is determined by whether or not uh, you're going this way or you're going that way, right? So um, the work done on the gas is positive when you're compressing it and negative when the gas is expanding. So uh, in this scenario where you're talking about an engine, the work, the net work, if you consider you know, that the part that has overlapping volume here cancels, the net work is just the area between the two curves. So you could kind of, I know you can't do this in your notes, but you can look at this area here between the two curves, and that is the net, or that the magnitude of that area is um, the magnitude of W net. And the sign of that, you can tell this is a useful engine because uh, the net work done is, uh, if you, well, you can say it two ways. The net work done on the gas is minus its negative, or flip that around and say the net work done by the gas on the environment is positive. So that's why this is useful as an engine, is because it's doing more work on the environment than the other way around. Otherwise, it would not be a good engine. Okay, so what is this QH? What are we comparing this work to? Um, we're comparing it to how much energy uh, or how much heat has to be added to the system during this expansion step. Okay, so this this is um, let's see right. That's as the engine is pushing out on its environment. That environment. That's what happens in step three. The heat. The system is absorbing heat from the room. Remember we said this was an isothermal expansion step. So it's absorbing heat on that step three. So this is the heat absorbed on step three. Uh, this, this step, as it's going this way. So if you calculate those quantities, which we can do um, using the tools we've already developed in this course, you can calculate both this and that and calculate the efficiency of this particular this particular cycle that we've drawn in the PV diagram. For a different cycle um, or a different shaped uh, loop in the PV diagram, you'll get a different efficiency. So, um, okay, now that's how we think about engines. Let's now talk about how do we measure how good is a refrigerator. So in this scenario, how do we judge how good it is? Um, and in that case, the, the quantity is not efficiency. It's called coefficient of performance. Sometimes 
shortened to COP. And for, for a refrigerator, this evaluates how good is, how good is the refrigerator working. Um, and again, it's somewhat similar to um, what we just wrote down for the engine, but it's also different here. The W net is the same quantity that is saying how much work uh, is required to, to on the gas, and then uh, QC tells is how much heat is extracted from the refrigerator side. So it's in both the engine efficiency and the COP, the numerator is um, is quantifying what's being useful, what's useful about the system. So the useful thing for a refrigerator is how much heat is extracted from the refrigerator, and the cost of that is the work that you do as you're compressing the gas, that's what this W net is. And for the engine, what I just erased, it's the opposite. The useful thing in the numerator is the net work done by the engine, and the cost is the heat that has to be added um, from the outside. So it's always benefit over cost, whether you're talking about COP or about engine efficiency. Okay, so this is, QC is the heat extracted um, uh, during this step three here from the refrigerator picture. Remember we extract heat from the fridge in step three. On this PV diagram. And W net again is is still going to be uh, the area enclosed by this cyclic loop here. So this area enclosed is still W net. Um, in this case, though, it has uh, a different sign because this the direction that we're going around the loop is opposite. So if you actually did this integral for both directions and added them up, in this case you would get a uh, one sign for this answer, in this case you would get a different sign for the answer. Um, and in this case it's quantifying how much total work we have to do to, to extract this useful heat. Okay, so I think I'm going to stop this video here.